morning and welcome to yet another entertaining and educating episode of the father-in-law. Please uh, remember that what we discuss in this show does not substitute legal advice. In the event you have a legal challenge, kindly consult a lawyer in your area. And my name is Zoks, your father-in-law, and today I have a guest who is a brother, Cholinkomo, and uh, I am going to be discussing the various aspects of the labor law with him, an esteemed colleague, and we are hoping to just simplify labor law and what it means and what are the consequences of certain workplace uh, incidents or failure to deal with certain workplace incidents. Joala, welcome to the show and thank you for blessing us with your time. Good morning, Trengeba, and um, good morning to your listeners. And um, briefly tell us about, about yourself. Uh, you know, it's, it's never easy to talk about your own brother. So I would yes. rather you blow your trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am Smanga Sitini. Um, I hail from the Free State. My ancestry is in the Eastern Cape. We are the descendants of those who left with King Shonto after the killing of Magistrate Hope Kutsolo. So when my great-grandfather was in the Free State, um, he attended to the Home Affairs uh, offices to register for his Dombas. Now, his surname, I'm told, is Mda. Mda mean, meaning a border. Yeah. So the, pers the people in the Free State at Home Affairs at the time, which was called uh, Inland, uh, uh -huh. yeah, uh, they couldn't understand what Mda means. So they kept on asking him, what is this Mda, 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 or whatever. <laughs> so I think he got to the extent that he, he didn't know what else he should say. And then he said, CT in Igengoku. Then that is what they could capture. And that's what became our surname, oh. CT. Yes. Yeah. And, and I know in those olden days, uh, if the Africaners uh, couldn't uh, pronounce your surname, yes. they'll give you the first thing that came to, yes. to their mind. So the surname CT it was actually a surname that was given after the, the home affairs people couldn't. <laughs> couldn't comprehend what Mta means. Yeah, if, yes. if you look like uh, your frame was big, they would say, no, man, it's a hot boy. Hot boy, yes. <laughs> and then yes. we, 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 we vernacularize it and say Mtim cool or exactly. something like that. Exactly. All right. Yes. And professionally, what do you do, my brother? I'm a member of Johannesburg Bar Council and also Papasa. And um, yes, and then I... At times, I do uh, respond positively to the call to the bench, and I've acted at the uh, Labour Court. Okay. And for the sake of the viewers out there, um, do you practice as an attorney or do you practice as an advocate? I mean, it always confuses people. Yeah. Every now and then, I'm even referred to as an advocate, and I correct it many times. No, no, no. I do not practice as an advocate. After that. That's <laughs> I. It doesn't matter, but we're giving you that title. No, I practice as an advocate yeah. um, uh, uh, with chambers in Senton. Yes. Yes. And what, what area of law do you focus in, my brother? I know as lawyers, we are as good as the instructions that come our way, but yes. sometimes we have those areas that are close to, to your heart. I mean, I'm a human rights lawyer through and through. Yeah. I have a passion for that, but for survival, I take just about every other matter that I feel confident or competent to deal with. But my soft spot, public interest law, if you yeah. like, but uh, in your case, uh, what I've dealt, I've dealt with various aspects of our law, from divorces to criminal, well, I, I've happened to be in, in various criminal cases, uh, which I still do at magistrate courts. Um, uh, constitutional matters, admin law matters. Um, but I've been getting lots on labor law, which is something that interests me. 
All right. Yeah. Then perhaps let's focus on that. Yes. <clears throat> um, you know, labor law presupposes a, an employer-employee relationship. And a lot of people don't seem to understand the full extent of the implications of their actions or inactions in a workplace environment. And I've had a number of clients, especially women, complaining that uh, when they complain about issues of sexual harassment, employers, especially male employers, don't seem to take it seriously. Sometimes they laugh them off or they just uh, become flippant about, about it. And, and I know that our laws are quite strict and there could be serious consequences arising from sexual harassment related cases. And in some cases, I've also had complaints from the male guys to say, we flat around with our female colleagues, we talk foul language, and when it suits them, then they report it. And, 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 and they too feel that sometimes they are subjected to vexatious, frivolous complaints. And one can understand sometimes why employers would tend not to take this seriously. And I'm not making excuses. Yes, yes. The fact of the matter is uh, <clears throat> workplace environment is supposed to be exactly that, a workplace environment where you tender your services to produce for the benefit of the employer and in return the employer pays you a salary. Can you just uh, take us um, through the basic relationship requirements in a workplace uh, environment? For example, what is expected of employees, what is expected of employers, and what are the consequences for either set not acting in accordance with the law and the expectations? Yes, you've just touched on the issue of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is, a, is, 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 it could be a conduct that is um, made by a male or female towards another and that conduct is not um, uh, welcomed or it is not liked. Uh, for instance, um, flirting or trying to be f to flirt with a female or a female trying to flirt with a male at, at, uh, at the workplace, that could, be <clears throat> that could be regarded as sexual harassment. The male petting um, a female on, 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 on the back, or the back, that could also be sexual harassment. Um, um, inappropriate hugs, um, hmm. trying to kiss a person, uh, that could be a, um, sexual harassment. So it's, it's wide. Um, but any conduct that <clears throat> is not welcomed and constitutes or it could be seen to constitute a sexual harassment, it could lend an employee into serious problem. What about uh, comments, not necessarily physical, uh, you know, conduct? Could uh, comments with sexual undertones also be classified as sexual harassment? Look, suppose a lady who's well-shaped um, uh, passes, and then you you say, "Hey, Manolo Pagile," yeah, or you say to her, "O That is uh, that is that constitutes sexual harassment. Yes, like even if you just uh, acknowledging the beauty man of yeah. nature. Re remember in our in our setup, township setup or traditional setup, yes. you'll find that when a lady passes a comment that would be regarded as culturally appropriate will be dolumdwan. Yes. That there is no space for that in the workplace. Yes. It, like because it, inherently it has sexual undertones. Yes. So it should, it should not be encouraged at all um, in, in, in the workplace. But perhaps let me emphasize, uh, Brazoks, uh, that <clears throat> there are there could be serious implications for an employer who does not attend um, speedily or appropriately to um, sexual advances that are perpetrated by 
male employees. For instance, there is a municipality in the Eastern Cape. What happened, <clears throat> this senior manager uh, working for the municipality in the Eastern Cape, um, they were working till late with this female uh, 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 colleague. And what then happened is that um, he thought they had established a rapport. Yes. And um, at the end of uh, a late night, uh, he, he hugged her and sort of tried to insert his tongue into the female's uh, mouth. Uh, the female uh, employee was so traumatized by that conduct because that, that's not what she expected or she asked for. And the municipality didn't take appropriate steps, let alone disciplinary action against this person on the basis that no, uh, the, they have smoked a peace pipe. The lady proceeded and take the municipality to court. And in the end, the municipality had to, to was ordered by the court to pay millions of friends towards the lady due to sexual harassment. For a hug and an yes, attempted kiss? It was uh, close to four million. Yes. It was yes. close to four million. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, the case has not been appealed. To the, to the Supreme Court of Appeal. So that decision stands? That decision stands and um, by now, uh, I suppose the municipality has paid that, those millions. As a result of the conduct of an, of an employee? Yes, as a result of a conduct of an employee, that is very, very serious. Um, uh, let me also make you an example of a... <coughs> It's 2010, during Soccer World Cup. It is um, um, at Barberton uh, Correctional Services. Mm. What happened there is that the prison officials were watching soccer as it was happening in the country and negligently left the keys um, and, and, and such that prisoners or offenders... The keys to the cells. The keys to the cells. <clears throat> and then what happened is that well, few of the offenders or prisoners got hold of the keys, they opened, and then they left the prison. <laughs> That's the power of football. <laughs> yes. Now, what then happens, while these chaps are watching um, soccer, the following morning, unfortunately, a lady was raped by the very same uh, prisoners who have escaped from prison. Well, whether they have escaped or they walked off, it's another story. Yeah. So what then happened was that um, the lady who unfortunately got raped instituted proceedings against the Minister of Correctional Services, right? And the issue was arising from the negligence arising of the, from the negligence prison of, officials. Of the prison officials. It was considered, yes, indeed, prison officials were negligent. Instead of patrolling and ensure the keys are kept with them, they watch soccer, uh, World Cup, and, and that was it. And the, the, the Minister of Justice had to pay millions of friends for that. So that's what we call vicarious liability. It may not be strictly, in a sense, a, 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 an employee, a, a, a labor law issue, but it tells you the how... Principle. The, yes, it, it tells you how the conduct of the employee could result in the employer having to pay millions. Yes, like, and, and I guess, you know, I'm just thinking about it practically, you know, as a man, and I'm not confessing to anything, how easy it is for us to be flirtatious and, 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 and skating on thin ice, because sometimes even when an objection is made against that conduct. We take it, ah, man, I you know, man, baby, I was just playing. And uh, you carry on, you comment about the lady's boobs, the frame, uh, the looks, the eyes, uh, bedroom eyes, and all of those things. Yeah. So from what you say, all of those comments can actually constitute sexual harassment. Yes. Um, remember females have a right to to dress up in the manner in which they feel comfortable. Yes. Males do not have any right 
to make um, flirtatious comments about them. So if, if a male wants to flirt, please do it at home. So we now know that it can cut both ways, but you and I know the reality and the odds of a male opening a case of sexual harassment against a, a female is not going to happen. Well, it, 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 it does in certain instances, but those are cases that do not receive media uh, oh, coverage. Okay. Yes. Okay, but yes. For, 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 for our purposes, it can happen and it remains unlawful and there are consequences nonetheless. For our purposes, it remains, uh, it remains um, uh, just like that. But I also have to highlight, remember we are a very diverse society. And in, at the workplaces, you find persons of um, same sex. Uh, so it will be also inappropriate for for unwelcome comments to be directed at gay persons or oh, lesbians. Yes. So even that, it has to be it has it has to be nipped in the bud. Uh, whoever who 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 is a lesbian, whoever who is gay, they have got equally a right mm. not to be treated or, or to, to receive or to be bombarded with unwelcome comments uh, which could constitute uh, sexual discrimination. I guess um, the same would go for religion? Correct. The same would go for religion. Um, I mean, I'm a Muslim. Um, on Fridays, I go for my congregational prayers, and I don't take alcohol at all. I don't take pork and stuff like that. And a person of uh, Christian faith, of Jewish faith, Hindu faith, Baha'i, and etc., they all have to ensure that once they are at the workplace, mm. they interact with each other in a harmonious kind of a way. No one will say, I hate Jews, I hate Muslims, I hate Christians, and stuff like that. So discrimination as well is protected on the basis of the religion that one practices. Yeah. So in labor law, it's very important that the employer must always, in its policies, ensure that its policies, they are in line with the, the various labor legislation that we have in the country. And I guess uh, the employer has the same right to guard against the xenophobic uh, comments or practices. Correct. Remember, um, in terms of our laws, employers can employ persons who are foreign nationals. They come with a certain culture themselves mm. and they sh cannot and should not be discriminated against. Difficult balancing act for the Very employer. much so. Very yeah. much so. Yes. Okay. And, and, you know, it just dawned to me that lately I have observed tendencies um, in which children or persons of a young age are gainfully employed or they perform or render services in return for which they get, they get paid. For example, I see many children performing adverts I know for a fact that uh, in the rural areas, in the farms, uh, children below the age of 18 uh, work as a rule. It's, it's, it's like the norm. You know, in 2010 or 11, thereabout, I, I, I was privileged to handle a case of a 14-year-old who was accused of having murdered uh, the late uh, Eugene Terra Blanche. Yes. And the, there was a whole focus in the media about the person the victim who had been killed. And very little attention was paid to the fact that at the origin, that boy was 14 years old when he was work, working in Mr. Terrablanche's farm for 14 hours a day, staying under squalid conditions. And, and I was quite amazed at how the Department of Labor seemed to be content about that, just as if everybody had forgotten that a child was doing hard labor and everybody focused on the alleged consequences of his actions against his employer. And uh, it's, it's an open secret, the boy was fighting for his uh, two-week salary, which the employer hadn't paid. And I tried without success, 
to try and get the Department of Labor to undertake a study to see how prevalent uh, this practice is so that the children's rights must also take center stage and, and, and be nipped in the bud, that type of practice be nipped in the bud. So what, what, what happens, that's a, a coercive example, but what happens in instances where parents themselves encourage their children to participate in adverts or to dancing for a living. There's a young DJ, they call him DJ Arch. Yeah. The boy has been DJing from the age of four and he's eight years old now and he's, he's killing it. Hmm. And he's in no way to take, in no position to take sound legally binding decisions. Hmm. So it therefore stands to reason that his parents are taking those decisions for him. Yeah. What does the law say in, in those cases? Nobody's forcing them, if you compare that with the example I gave you, but the common denominator is that they are children, yes. nonetheless, and performing yes. remunerative work. Yes. Our laws do not allow child labor as a starting point, and mm -hmm. that is from the International Human Rights Instruments, uh, International Labor Organization, yes. which South Africa is a signatory to, to, to that convention. Now, but we must make a distinction. <clears throat> if you take Zola Jr., for instance, mm. who is a minor, he is very artistic and stuff like that, and then he features on an advert. Yes. That is not regarded as a child labor in a true sense of the word. Okay. But if, jo if Zola Jr. is employed by uh, the Kumalos in the Kumalos garden, that is child labor. Now, when it comes to the issue of Zola Jr. featuring on adverts or on episodes or on, var on, on acting, what that means is that a contract is going to be signed on behalf of Zola Jr. by yourself. Okay. Now, it is not child labor in, a, in, in, in that sense, but the, the child is rendering services which, re remember the TV is watched by even small children oh, and yes. stuff like that. It will depend. I mean, you've got Dagalani Sesame and stuff like that. You can't have grown-ups doing a, a children's act. You'll have to have a children doing those acts so that the, the children who are watching them, they can identify and relate. and relate to what is being done. So in that particular instance, it's not child labor in terms of, of our laws. But in an instance where Zola Jr. goes to the Kumalos to work in a garden or to work in the shop, that means the Kumalos and Zola Jr., they've got a contract, an employment contract, which is illegal in our law. So that cannot be allowed. Sure. But the reality of our situation is that it happens quite often because uh, children may be encouraged to and their own keep or to an extra pocket money or in some instances the economic realities of that particular family may be such that everyone needs to chip in. Yes, unfortunately that is the case but um, children should not be employed uh, as minors uh, because um, that is against the law. You may have observed that a um, few months ago there was an international conference on child labor in Devon. Yes, I saw that. Yes, yes. which was addressed by the, uh, by the uh, President Ramaphosa. Actually, the entire globe met in Devon to say, to reaffirm that child labor should not be, um, uh, should be eradicated. It still happens. Yeah. It's prevalent. You've seen um, uh, in, in civil, in, in war-torn places where children have been used as child soldiers and stuff like that, committed heinous crime at the instance of those who, um, who are commanding them. So that is a no-no. And tell me, you know, I've, I've taken an interest in social media purely because... I am trying to understand the freedom with which people say and do all manner of things about, about each other. And I have also seen some persons wearing work uniform, 
and making comments that, in my view, appear inappropriate. And I was wondering whether or not in those instances can an employer enforce discipline against an employee for conduct that happens outside of the workplace, whether they're wearing uniform or not wearing uniform. But can an employer say, hey, the way you were twerking at a party half naked um, does not augur well for the image of, of my organization and you are bringing my organization into disrepute. The general rule is that the, the conduct of the employee, say outside office hours, um, it can, if, if an, a, a link can be established that it has put the image and the reputation of the employer into disrepute, that's where the, the employer can take actions. For instance, if, if, if in your social page, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, whatever, you say, I work for Zolama Javu Incorporated, right? And then you hell racist remarks, xenophobic remarks, uh, ethnic remarks against whoever. As an employee of Zolama Javu Incorporated, it means when you come back at work on a Monday, Everybody has seen those posts, what you think. It means the responsibility of the employer, Zulama Javu Inc., is to call that employee in to say, hey, we've observed or we've noted your, the comments you made in the media, in the social networks. Those are putting the image of Zolama Javu Incorporated into disrepute. Right. Our policy as Zolama Javu Incorporated says racist comments, xenophobic comments, or anything discriminatory cannot be allowed, and it's a dismissible offense. Wow. So it means you now have to charge that employee. Now, let me make you an, another example. It's in a mining setup. The, the, the employees work at the mines and they stay in the villages, mine villages. What then happens is that the employee was alleged to have assaulted and raped a lady at the, in the mining village. This was outside on Saturday, Sunday, right? Not any. And the victim was not even an employee of the, the mine. The victim was not an employee in the mine. But how do you establish a link? The link is that he, he, he stayed at the mining village, he works for the mine, and ordinarily, the name of the mine is going to be mentioned. It involves assault and rape against the woman. And the labor court did find, correctly so, that um, it was appropriate for the employer to dismiss the, emplo the, the, the employee in those circumstances. Another example that I can make is one that involves a police person. Mm. This police person allegedly raped the daughter, right? And the minister of police heard this. He says, uh-uh, this puts, this, that conduct puts the image of the, of, the, of the police force, of the police services into disrepute. Minister of Police instituted um, disciplinary hearings against this particular police person for raping his own daughter at his own house. It went to the to the to to the to the internal hearing. The daughter um, uh, testified that indeed her father raped her, well, repeatedly, unfortunately, and the disciplinary. Um, um, chairperson of the disciplinary hearing found the police person guilty of the offence and recommended dismissal as the appropriate sanction in the circumstances. But that was taken to, to, to Labour Court ultimately. 
And um, when it was taken there, correctly it was found that um, the employer had the responsibility to, to charge the employee consent. And this is notwithstanding the fact that criminal proceedings may or may not still be pending. Yes. This is besides the criminal pro proceedings uh, uh, being instituted. What is What should be emphasized is that immediately that kind of a conduct happens. As an employer, you have a serious responsibility mm. to ensure that you attend to it the moment you hear about it. So to, to wrap this up, Joala, you're saying <laughs> these flirtatious comments that we we throw about at will without even thinking about it could lead to serious consequences for you as an employee and also for the employer in the event that they might have failed to take action against you as an employee. Correct. Correct. Um, remember, we spend lots of time at the places of employment. And it means the environment should be conducive such that a person looks forward to going to work. You shouldn't have stressors at work. Right? So that environment should be free of discrimination, of any form of abuse in any form. So it is quite important that if there is a desire to flat, it should be directed um, at, at persons that uh, you know you've got uh, a jurisdiction over. <laughs> or, or at the very least who won't object. So everything is okay until someone objects. And it doesn't matter that on the previous 10 occasions she was flirting back, I comment about her bum, she comments about my butt. But, but on the day that she says, I don't approve, that's where it ends. Well, I would, I would, I would say those comments should be reserved for the privileged. Yes. Yes, it should not be a comment that you become very gracious about uh, because you may find yourself um, having to spend lots and lots of, money, of legal fees defending your conduct, which uh, you ought to have avoided. Should have been avoided in the first place. Yes. And this business uh, of gents uh, asking ladies to send them nudes or themselves volunteering nudes of their private parts, it's an absolute no-no. Well, there has been, let, let, let's talk about the issue of um, WhatsApp groups. Yes. You are an administrator of the WhatsApp group, right? Someone uh, uh, sends uh, pictures that are inappropriate, which are deemed to be inappropriate. Yes. Or um, without really um, being too observant, um, someone says, hey, um, Kathy, uh, please send me your notes. And then it comes into your the group. Into the group. And Kathy may take an offense and say, in as much as we've got a rapport, this constitutes sexual harassment mm. because it's now known by this group. So it, it shouldn't be something that is, uh, that is, that is encouraged. So Jola, in sum, what typically happens if an employee feels that their rights in the workplace are violated? Just basic steps. What are the remedies uh, available to such an employee? Look, there are a number of remedies available. For instance, if an employee, there are instances where the employer can make the working condition conditions um, unfair, unfavorable for the employee, resulting in the employee resigning from, from, from work. The employee can now approach the CMA and say, look, I was constructively dismissed and takes the matter to the CCMA. If the CCMA finds for the employee, then that would be it. But if the employer says, uh-uh, the, the CCMA ought not to have found for the, for the employee, it will take it to the labor court, it will go to the labor appeal court and up to the constitutional court, if that is, uh, if, 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 if it comes to that. Now, in instances where the employee had not resigned on their own volition, but uh, they find themselves dismissed for reasons that they do not regard as 
legally valid? What can an employee in such cases do? Well, you will have a situation of Section 189, for instance, where the employer, for economic reasons, for technical reasons or technological reasons, will say, look, my systems to operate, to manufacture um, these classes, it's now redundant, such that my competitors, uh, my competitors have now um, attracted my, my customers. Therefore, I have to close down and stuff like that. In that case, a proper uh, procedure has to be followed to ensure that uh, there is retrenchments, right? But if the employee is aggrieved by such uh, uh, retrenchments, the Labour Court will be there to deal with the matter and, um, and, and, and it will depend again on why the employee says Section 189 was ought not to have been instituted. So basically it is open to an employer who for whatever economic reasons feels I can no longer carry my entire workforce, I've got to reduce my workforce. Yes. In, in, in that case there is a process that must be followed. So the employer doesn't just willingly decide out of the fifth, I'm going to chop this 25. Yes, you can't. the employer cannot wake up in the morning to say, look, I don't like uh, Mr. Majavo. He's very cheeky. Therefore, Section 189 against him. That cannot happen. Um, uh, but in an instance where there's an economic rationale which can, could be proven, uh, the employer has had to close uh, some of its operations, and it can prove from the financial point of view that indeed it's experiencing an economic downturn. In that instance, Section 189 would be justifiable. A parting shot, there is this perception by, especially by foreign-owned companies, that the labor laws of South Africa make it very difficult to, to fire people. Um, and sometimes it becomes a disincentive for investors to invest in South Africa because of this notion that before you fire a person, there is this elaborate process that you have to follow. What does the law say in general about how an employee may be lawfully dismissed? What is it that the employer must do as, as we conclude? Well, the starting point in our constitution is that everyone has a right to a fair labor practice. So that's what our constitution states. And Labor Relations Act also emphasized that point. So for, for, for the employer to, to, to ensure that a person is relieved of his or her responsibilities, it must ensure that it follows the correct procedure and there are substantive reasons that are fair that, uh, uh, to justify the dismissal of the employee. So if procedural fairness and substantive fairness are proved, um, um, in like, in, in, it, 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 it is likely that even the Labour Court can confirm that indeed the, 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 the dismissal of the employee was substantively fair and uh, uh, pr procedurally fair. But everything will start at the bargaining council or CCMA. So it matters not whether or not an employee misbehaved. It's, it's clear cut. You caught the employee stealing from you or sleeping on duty. You still have to follow a fair process to get to the substantive part, which is the reasons why such employee must be, must be fired. Yes, correct. Uh, a, a, a correct procedure still has to be followed. Uh, but there are instances where um, it's a clear cut case. But even in those instances, a procedure has to be followed. So if you don't follow the procedure, notwithstanding the fact that you had a good reason to dismiss, as an employer, you may find yourself in the short end of the stick. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, dear Jola. It, it was quite uh, insightful. And uh, to the viewers out there, thank you for watching. And we will be back with another episode of The Father-in-Law. Please like, subscribe, comment, throw some views and ideas so that this show can only become better and better. We, we learn from each other and the cheerio from Zoom's your father-in-law.